let's say that I just was in a turkey coma on Thursday and I fell asleep for the whole game. How would you summarize Cowboys Giants? Um, I, I would say uh, it was a little disappointing in the first half, but workmanlike. And then the second half looked a little bit more like expected. And uh, I, but I mean, I think they it was fine. They did what they absolutely had to do. There was not an equal distribution of talent on the field. The Giants had way too many people who were hurt, and that's why the uh, offensive sluggishness of the first half was a little disappointing. Not because they were coming off what they did against Minnesota, because I, I tried, I said it during the broadcast in Minnesota, and um, we may have talked about it the next day. La in the NFL, last week and this week have never met. <laughs> they have nothing to do with each other. So don't judge what happened last week uh, what what is, by what you think should happen next week. It's a different game. It's a different environment. It's a different mentality. So the fact that they uh, had some problems with the Giants that they didn't have with the Vikings, even though the Vikings are a better team than the Giants, that, that didn't really concern me. You just don't want to let a team that you're better than hang around because anything, as we're seeing, anything can happen in these games. And then they didn't in the end. They didn't. I, I, the, one, the one regret I have is that I think I didn't say it on the air, Sean. Uh, it, late in the first half, I was thinking, and I know I said it to Bob Thomas, my statistician. I said, well, can they get the tight ends involved, please? I'm not kidding. I really, because they had two catches for tight ends. I think that's one of their weapons. Yeah. Well, that's a little bit of what happened in the second half, and that really helped. It opened things up a little bit. And then, then the Giants kind of got beaten down. And so, you know, some of these games, Indianapolis won't be as easy as people want to think. People want to think that because they don't know anything about the Colts, but they've got some good players. Now it's a game that Dallas, uh, I think they're already a big favorite. But, I mean, it won't be, it won't be easy. The, the good news is uh, on paper and the way that the Cowboys are playing, I think there's a reasonable expectation that you can win these next three, and then you become the NFL um, equivalent of bowl eligible when you get to 11. <laughs> Did you leave Thursday's game? Do you feel better about the run defense or the receiver group? That's a good question. Uh, the run defense is always, I'm uh, maybe the receiver group, but I include the tight ends in the receiver group. But the, the, here's the thing about the run defense. It's the numbers to which they held Barkley. That's great. Yeah. Uh, and, and Daniel Jones. Yeah. Um, you know, I think there were opportunities the Giants may have had to try to run the ball more and, and didn't. And, some, and you can't control the other coaches thinking, and that kind of can play into it. The, the only thing about judging the run defense is – uh, that you, the game sometimes dictates that strategy, and it can it can kind of uh, skew your perception of of what you're looking at. It's not in a vacuum. So I think they've still got to they're going to still have to deal with the run defense issues. And anybody who watched last night knows that that's that's not going away. <laughs> but there's there's ways to combat it that don't necessarily have to do just with scheme and talent, but also with how the game is going. Brad Sham here on Sean and RJ, 105 through the fan. Where do you stand on all this Odell Beckham hype? Um, I, I, I think it's, I think I'd be for signing him. Um, I, I think that people need to, and, and the weekend airplane incident aside, cause I, um, I, I, I think I saw, your tweet. I don't think that really has any effect on anything. Yeah. That people, there's too many people who know him. I've never met him. Too many people who know him, uh, including I, I spoke to Bob Papa, the Giants announcer, uh, about this last week. And uh, I mean, they uh, there's a lot of people who say he's, he's a good teammate and he wants to win, and uh, that's okay with me. He can be selfish. Receivers can be selfish. Um, as long as they also want to win more and, and they're good teammates. I, I think there's two things that I would say. One is look at Gallup, who is maybe kind of just 
still rounding into physical form, and we're on the same rough, except three weeks later, uh, trajectory. Bobby's written a lot about this that with Beckham that we are with Gallup. So he's got a now he's done it before. He's had an ACL. He knows how to deal with it. He's a veteran player, and he's obviously an extremely talented player. Um, uh, but just don't expect to see, you know, Beckham at at the height of his power. And the other thing, you people really don't want to hear this, but this is professional football, and you can't fall so much in love with the idea of signing the guy that you make a stupid business decision. He's going to want more than one year. Yeah. He doesn't want to just come in here for Christmas vacation. <laughs> Or here or New York or Buffalo or wherever he's going to. And I don't know how many people are really serious about signing him for what he's going to want or if the Cowboys are competing against themselves in reality. I don't know that. But I do know that he's going to want multiple years. Now, your decision has to be how much money are you willing to tie up for how long in order to have him now. I'd, I'd be interested in seeing if him being in the mix next year would not be a good thing. They knew they had to address the receiver thing when they let Cooper go, when they traded Cooper. And the reason you know that they knew it is that they signed Washington and they drafted a receiver in the third round. So obviously they were paying attention to it. And I I still think that he would help. But you have to be careful. You can't mortgage – unless you really don't care about – you know, the money that you're going to need to sign Lamb and Diggs and Parsons um, and Pollard. Um, but you have to pay attention to those things. When we talked to Jerry on Friday, essentially went through the idea that, you know, non-quarterbacks aren't really up for consideration for MVP a whole lot anymore. And if that surprised him, and he was like, not really. When you consider the outsize uh, contributions that quarterbacks bring to the game, he 100% gets why that is. So we might still see a sporadic votes here and there, but it feels like this award could be locked into the quarterback for a really long time. So my question for y'all is if we created our non-quarterback MVP, who would get your vote? I got some candidates. Okay. I do have Diggs, Stefan Diggs oh. on my list. Oh, The reason I have him elevated over Jefferson and Hill at this point, I mean, their numbers are so close because he has four more touchdowns than the next guy in that, that grouping. Jefferson okay? and Hill's touchdowns are pretty low. Yeah, considering, but I mean, they, they move their team up and down the field yeah, and then yeah. their targets, but I, I get it. So I'm putting Diggs in that category. I'm putting Travis Kelsey in that category. He leads the league oh. in receiving touchdowns with 12 as a tight end. And I don't know if a team's ever going to be able to come up with a way to stop this guy. Like, even with all the things they have, him and Mahomes just understand what they're doing together. And it's it's pretty destructive. Josh Jacobs. Kevin has now made mm. his way onto my list at 1,159 yards mm. and nine touchdowns. What team does he play on? 105 yards per they game. They suck. The what worst is this, team. The Major League Baseball, where he can be on a bad team and win MVP? He is. He is. He is good. All right, then then Derrick Henry, because he's on a team that's bad, but they act like they're good. They're 74. Yeah, they they're in first Hanna. place. Yeah, what, where they were in first place last year, and then what happened? They lost to the Bengals in the first round. The Bengals went to the Super Bowl. Exactly. Yeah. They beat the Chiefs. Yeah. they. You know what? The Bengals were the best, except for the Rams. And then my last two oh, people yeah. would be definitely Micah and Ju- Matt Judon. I think both of those guys are very similar in their category, but Micah has, like, he has the touchdown. He has a couple extra fumble recoveries. There are just some other things that Micah has been able to add to it. So I would definitely have those five guys in my my category. Unless so, that's six. So for Micah, I, the one that I thought was amazing is on NFL.com after Thursday's win over the Giants. They just put Micah is inevitable. And yeah. And so... That's right. And then the Giants disappeared. Is he's the defensive player of the year front runner, netted two sacks for the sixth time this season. And yes, Corey, because of you, I've become very fascinated by he gets zero sacks or he gets two sacks in every single game. 
He became the third player to have 12 plus sacks in his first two seasons, joining Alden Smith and Reggie White. And obviously you hope he goes more of the Reggie White direction than the Alden Smith direction. He's on pace to break numerous early defensive records, including most multi-sack games at this point. I think he's in the mix for non-QB non MVP for sure. Don't you feel like Micah will definitely go more Reggie White direction than Alden Smith? You know what? I do, but I also kind of wonder, like, uh, how did people feel about Alden Smith at the time? Like, it's tough to reflect back on that if they were like, well, there's nothing that's ever going to slow him down. There's something internally with Micah that I think is going to make that's, the difference. That's the difference for me is it just seems like a guy who... That's fair. Everything about him is geared towards how do I go win whatever. Yeah, And yeah, yeah. not, hey, I'm just superiorly gifted. Yeah. And I'm showing up and I'm this good. Like, even with Sean Merriman, I think one of the things was he was in the wrong city. Uh, you know, he was in a in a place where he caught got caught up in all the stuff that was going on and also steroids. And so like that What? Wasn't that am I wrong about that? That that was a positive test, correct? I don't even the, know. So like that was about. his in his world, there was something different out there. Here in Dallas, I mean, I know there's a lot of glitz and glamour that goes along with the Cowboys, but I think that Micah's like his whole approach is very different than these guys. Okay, so I had the two other logical candidates for me were the receivers. Is like Patrick Peterson was asked about Justin Jefferson being the MVP. And he's like, yeah, MVP. He's having that type of year where he should be considered. Now, the wild thing about that is, did you know that last year Cooper Cup was the first wide receiver to even get a vote for MVP since Randy Moss in 1998. Think about how crazy that is. We went 23 years from a vote mm -hmm. for a wide receiver. Not to mention the fact that wide receivers don't win MVPs in the foot in the NFL. From the 682, Max Crosby has 10 and a half sacks and zero help around him and gets doubled almost every play. Who was the help? Who was the help going into the season around Micah? Demarcus? Yes. Uh, Diggs? Like, I mean, going into the season, it's Micah that yeah. makes the, that makes yeah. Dorrance Armstrong. Yeah. He, he gives those opportunities come up. Now, Dorrance is taking advantage of I was going to say, I'm starting to, I definitely feel like Dorrance Armstrong has got something. But coming uh, into the season, yeah. it was like Micah and De Demarcus Lawrence, and you were like, Demarcus is aging. Like that, That's kind of where and you were with a this. A lot of people were worried about the loss of Randy Gregory. Yeah. 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 And then Dor it hasn't mattered. At all. Dorrance like, at and all. other names keep stepping in. But so look what he's done for Denver. <laughs> Not much. <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> he, got, he, did, he did a little I, something oh, early in the on. season. If you saw what Russell Wilson's doing over there, wouldn't you say my hamstring hurts or whatever? Oh, my God, yes. You'd be like, I don't. But you're going to have to say your hamstring hurts for the next five years because he's stuck there. <laughs> Is All right, so the other two people, Justin Jefferson and Tyreek Hill. So, Justin Jefferson is on pace for 125 catches, 1,904 yards, and eight touchdowns. Like, that's a crazy that's year. Insane. Tyree Kill is on pace for 134 catches, 1,906 yards, and six touchdowns. The, the issue that they're going to run into is almost like when Adrian Peterson, he had to break 2,000 yards to win MVP. I think that you have to break 2,000 yards and break the record. So, the record for most receiving yards in a season is 1,964. The record for most catches in a season is 149. I almost feel like you're at the point where you have to have 150 catches, 2,000 yards, and double-digit touchdowns to, like, really get in the MVP mix because Cooper Cup won the receiving triple crown. They're like, all right, you can have a couple of votes. And you say double-digit touchdowns, and, like, it's going to take a lot for them they're to get all, there at this trajectory. Yeah, Tyreek is way off that pace. I do wonder, Kevin, if you can add in something, an element to it, to like a, a sweetener. And what about a single-game single, se single game record? Okay. Or maybe even you do it twice. Uh, but a single game. Do you know the most receiving yards in a single game? Was it the Calvin Johnson game? I'm going to guess 315, but I don't know who it was. Very close. Okay. Uh, Calvin Johnson against the Cowboys had 329. Uh, 
just short of Flipper Anderson's 336 oh, for the, oh, Flipper. the Rams against yeah. the against the Saints in 89. You said 330? 336. How so, that guy wasn't a Dolphins receiver, nobody knows. <laughs> so you have one of those games that like puts a stamp on it. Yeah. I think it gets you more votes. I, there's no way it gets you. I still don't think yeah, there's any way. That would you, be, maybe even setting the single season record and a single game record. I still don't think there. See, I, that is the one scenario. But I think about it. I think Jefferson has to do it because for Tyreek Hill, the betting odds have shrunk and shrunk and shrunk for Tua to win MVP. So I feel like if Tyreek Hill hits. Those marks is people also be like, man, look at Tua. That, because uh, they had. Did you even watch that game yesterday, dude? Like, all they talked about was Tua. I mean, all they talked about was his offense. And I know the stat going around is he is undefeated. The Dolphins are undefeated in games in which he plays the whole game. Yeah, man. And so I wonder about that. But Justin Jefferson, there is no talk about Kirk Cousins being the MVP of the league. So if Justin Jefferson broke the re single game receiving record then i believe he would break the season long record that's a lot to ask for but in that scenario i believe he could win mvp but right now he'd probably be third best case scenario 400 yards receiving in a game then nobody's ever even like gotten you would hope that would win it for him i got him. both of those guys on my uh, fantasy team so i'm really fingers crossed yeah that. you would hope <laughs> that would get the job done but from the 214 not surprisingly is Micah would be your MVP. And then from the 972, people are saying two is going to win the regular MVP. But if you took it out of the quarterback hands, I think my vote right now would be Tyreek. Even though I know Tua is grabbing a lot of the credit. I think that's mine would be huge. Patrick Mahomes. Non-QB. Mm -hmm. But you said Tua. No, I said Hill, but then I thought you said over. No, no, I was reading somebody's text and I said, but oh. we're not doing that right now. We're doing non QB MVP. Jalen Hurts. <laughs> okay. As a running back, yeah. I see I'd where he's going running, with this. He's going to give it for, for his rushing statistics. I'm just kidding. Jalen Hurts fans, he's good. He is. I mean, it's it sucks. He, he, but he, he is threw good. for 150 yards yesterday. I saw. <laughs> In the 401, Judon has no help either. He's got Bill Belichick. I think that's pretty helpful. Like, that's the, one of the best defensive minds to ever coach the game. Yeah. And, like, he, he has shown over his career that somebody you've never heard of can <laughs> right. become a good player. Right. Uh, and, like, I think they're just very sound in the way that they approach it a lot of times. Some of the more fun tweets. How about Bobby Belt, who's going to join you in 90 minutes, our Cowboys insider? Don't look now, but CeeDee Lamb ranks second in the NFC in receiving yards this season. What's going right? I mean, there's been at least three games, hand-wringing games, like what the hell is going on with CeeDee Lamb? He doesn't know the route tree. He can't catch the damn ball. Now it's like he is playing like, I don't know, top eight receiver in the game. What, what, what do you think has gone right for him? I think having Dak Prescott certainly helping with Dak. He's looking like a 1,500-yard, 10-touchdown receiver would be the Ooh, projection since dude. Dak has come back. I mean, as a whole, the offense is averaging 12.4 points per game more. They're averaging 33.8 points per game. But but CD is just looking. And, and one thing that I think Bobby made a point of this morning when he was talking with Sean, you know, the mental mistakes, sure, that's something he needs to correct. But when he has one of those errors, it's not something that he, that's lingering. That That's an issue that, that bogs him down the entire game. Puts that behind him. He moves on. And he's actually had dominant performances throughout the remainder of the game. And I think he actually could have had a bigger day against the Giants. He was talking about in the postgame. We played the audio. You know, his one arm's being held the whole game. Some stuff's not being called. I mean, he, he scored on that play. I know, Like, they've man. got that weird re weird rule where they've got to have both the toe and the heel touch. If you're going backwards, is that the I rule? Guess. I guess. Mean, I, I learned that. Eagleton so tweeted it out and said he talked to the official, and that's how it was explained to him from DallasCowboys.com. So you can't just... I thought if you had any part of your foot in... So if you're actually falling backwards, you have to have heel... heel. Toe, toe, like the and, then, and then then you're out. I suppose, but we've That's seen the dumb. still shots of he's got he the toe down himself. and the other foot down. I thought it was an incredible catch, but you're starting to see him confidence wise, 
and that alpha mentality, he's starting to dominate games and stretches. He's yet to put it together for a full 60 minutes, but you're starting to see certain phases where he's taking over games and he's becoming that number one that we've been hoping for. You know, I, I thought the play in the end zone, it was one motion going toe to heel. I, I think, uh, you know, it didn't look like a touchdown to me, but the way that they've changed the rules, things are getting called receptions now. So it wouldn't have been a total surprise to me, especially when you froze it and, and they did on on the big screen there inside the stadium and, and CD for a second thought he, he might have had a catch. But whatever the case, it was an incredible catch of athleticism and the things that he is doing now is starting to set him apart from other receivers in, in football. The way that I think his career was supposed to take off, is he hitting his potential now? Can we say that's a good hit? Yeah, I kind of feel like in watching him play and watching the route running and then watching how they're using him in the route running, I think is more beneficial to how he makes plays. I think the high number of targets, too, helps him. I, you know, you, you look at and they, he's had games where he's had 11, 12, you know, 10, 15, 11 oh, targets. One of the most targeted dudes in yeah, the sport. Yeah, I mean, and, and I think that's, you know, he's, he's, coming, he's coming down with the ball. And, you know, like the Green Bay game. I mean, that that's... That's something, you know, I mean, they hit 11 catches in that game, 15 targets, you know, and that's how you, I think that's how you have to kind of use CD lamb. I think you have to just keep targeting him and, and, you know, he's going to find ways to make plays for you. And just getting him involved. They made a point early on in the game. It's like, okay, we're going to target him through the air. We're going to do some end around with Michael, him. We're going to make him run Michael the ball. They got Michael Gallup going too in yeah. that game. And I, I Absolutely think, they did. I think, that's, I think that's something that's really, really key going for it. A, a good Michael Gallup will help CD lamb. I, I really do believe that. That's why I think Odell Beckham being on this team would help would be CD, huge. Would help CD Lamb. And I and and Lamb has come up with some big catches, not just the tough circus ones, but there were a couple. Hey, it's third and twelve. Mm -hmm. Hey, it's third and fifteen. Dak's going to him, and he's coming up with the play. And a lot of that's credit to Dak too, because he had some pressure in his face. He made, Dak made some unbelievable throws and escaping pressure. The third and, and fifteen. Yeah, third and to Schultz for the touchdown. That was, was big. Oh, that was beautiful. But uh, it seems like CD Lamb is starting to starting to get himself together here, and he's dominating. Elsewhere in Cowboys Twitter, Michael Gelkin wrote the report, Tyron Smith nearing a return to practice. Terrence Steele's quote, it's awesome. His injury in general was devastating for us. We've been watching him rehab his way back these past couple of weeks. I can just tell the room is already excited to welcome him back. Everybody but Connor McGovern, right? Everybody's excited except Conor McGovern. Yeah, everybody's yeah. excited yeah. Conor McGovern. Very true. Right. Absolutely. But, hey, it, it can open up that Hulk package again where you get Conor McGovern at fullback and your short yardage should be even that much better. It does up our chances. The moment Tyron Smith returns, it ups our chances for the, uh, the McGovern touchdown. The, the big man touchdown. <laughs> Pardon me. You doing all right over there? No, let it out. No. That's weed. That's weed. You okay? I'm good. You know. Yeah, absolutely. Just took a breath there and I got a little you Celsius. You ain't choking, you ain't smoking. <laughs> right, dude. Um, no, not it was not as bad say. as the, uh, the battle, the uh, Sean versus Flem this morning. Oh, was oh, he relived that and in the battle? weekend beats. How did he do? How did he grade him? Uh, I mean, I think ultimately the, the Flem kicked his ass. Wow. Uh, but well, you guys That's make the call. G-Bag Nation makes the call in about 40 minutes. Perfect. Coming up at 440. Okay, we'll get some of the best audio from over the weekend and, and this morning. Uh, okay, so yeah, I, I think the other thing about Tyron is that maybe you bring him back slowly and he gets like a couple of series out there and you have Tyler play left guard in those and see how it's going. Cause I'm, I'm hoping for that, Brian, I don't know what your guys are saying, but he doesn't have a history of staying healthy for long. I need him to shake the rust off number one and number two, and maybe it should be number one, be healthy for the playoffs. I don't want to waste. We have a good enough system right now. I just need him to shake the rust off. Maybe play against the Bird Turds week 17 uh, or de December 24th. What is that? Week 16? Mm -hmm. Yes. You know, to give yourself a chance to win the division. But I, I, other than that, I just want to get him healthy in the playoffs. Yeah, I would like to. I I want to believe they're trying to get him ready for that that December 11th game against Houston. And then then the following week, you would have Jacksonville and then the and then uh, the Eagles. So maybe, you know, maybe two weeks before that big matchup against the Eagles on Christmas Eve. Okay. Uh, how about this tweet from John Mishota? All four NFC East teams would be in the playoffs if the season ended today. Isn't that fun? How about these commanders, man? The commanders are now 7-5. And, and Brian Robinson running the rock well. They're getting I a little lucky. Deserves some, maybe they are getting a little lucky. <laughs> that but, interception at the end of the game was hilarious. This NFC East, yes. And the, the hat that Robinson was wearing afterwards. Oh, the big, the big hat. hat. Hey, big hat. Okay, so 
if it ended today, the Cowboys as the top wild card team would play the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. The Buccaneers. And how'd they fumble fart that one away in Cleveland? That's got to sting. But, but still, Tristan Wirfs got hurt. Thank God, yeah. yeah worse, he's going to be out three to four weeks. High ankle? Yep. That's a bummer for them. Uh, but the good news for them is they could they could fiddle fart away a lot of these games, and they're yeah. still playing in the NFC South, going to find themselves hosting a playoff game. You know, your Brady, numbers, you, you love your numbers. How about this Brady We all love stat? our numbers, bro. 218 game streak snapped for Brady. It's the first time in that 218 game streak that he led by seven or more points in the final two minutes and lost a game. Oh, yeah. Wow, that's tough. Oh. A lot of firsts for Brady's oh. this year. I, I, th- I think we need Atlanta to get in there, and, and hopefully Atlanta can. Um, Me too. I'm, let's go. Atlanta. I'm, I'm terrified of Tom Brady. I think it would. W- w- you're 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 at risk of losing to a kryptonite player. Hell yeah, we should be terrified. You're not a good it's like team. They already beat you. Yeah, right? it, it's it, like it, Rodgers plays his best. Brady's going to play his best against us. I need I need that to be Minnesota. You know, I I would think about tanking a game late to become the 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 sixth team or something. You know, I well that would be the 49ers right now. I know that's yeah. what sucks, no. man. Is I, I we we should have all no, been the 49ers Seahawks are fan. division leaders. So yeah, the Seahawks are, or the or the Niners right now are, are in the lead for the NFC West division. It, ideally, the Niners would be a wild card team right there with us, and we yeah. would avoid playing them until. The NFC Championship game. What you really need so, is is Philly to lose a game here in the next couple of weeks, well, and then you, you week. beat them. Uh, yeah, the Titans are beat them on Sunday. Titans, oh, so shoot, the Titans are, are the prime team to knock the Eagles. Titans off. Titans can knock you up. off too. Yeah, they could. Yeah, they could. The thing would it be right now? So would it be Giants at San Francisco? I yeah. got that right. Yep. Yeah. Washington at Minnesota. That's the game you want. You want and to be then, the seven. And then Dallas is at Tampa Bay, right? Would those yep. be that be the matchups? What you got to do is figure out, okay, who of the lesser seeds, who are, what do you, you give the Giants no chance against San Francisco? No, right? I think the Cowboys are the only team that has a chance of the lesser seeds. Well, could the, could the commanders beat, could the commanders beat the Minnesota? Vikings? Sure. They played okay. a close game okay. earlier in the year. That would send the commanders to Philadelphia in the divisional oh round. Oh my gosh. And then you would have to go to San probably, Fran. Sa- yeah. probably San Francisco. You know, you'd want, you'd want the Vikings to just hold on so that they can play the Niners in the second round. You'd rather yeah. go to Philly than have to deal with the Niners, wouldn't you? I mean, that's how I feel. I, I feel the same way. I would rather play Philly in Philly yeah. than the Niners. I'd rather anywhere. take my chances of somebody else having to deal with the Niners. Yeah, Philly looks beatable. They're they're really you know being in some dog fights, and uh, Green Bay could have got them last night. You know they, they were just one stop away from Jordan Love having a chance to go you know throw for the game. Um, so I, I think Philadelphia is is much more vulnerable than San Francisco, who's who's getting healthy and absolutely hitting their stride. They'll, their defense you know. is just so good. I did see a, a great tweet that was a picture of Josh McDaniel. And it was if Kyle Shanahan didn't have a top five defense, <laughs> that's who he would be. <laughs> I like I it. I kind of agree with you. <laughs> okay. You are a Shanahan hater. You're on the record for that. <laughs> yeah. And uh, yeah. that's a strange hill to die on. I don't know what the man he's did to you. He's just overrated. Top four that's coach I feel. in the NFL. That's fair. You know, I don't know how. Maybe he's, maybe he'll get another team to the Super Bowl and then he'll earn your respect. Maybe. If he does that, he'd have it. Okay. Michael Gelkin, morning news. Uh, no, we're, we're dropping down here to art. Yeah, no doubt. That'd be nice. That would be. Uh, in my personal record book, CD Lamb made that touchdown grab on Thursday. And in Walter's oh, yeah. personal record book, Shanahan's never sniffed a Super Bowl. Yeah. Yeah. What's well, in your has, personal he's record book? <laughs> he's, he's lost it for every team he's coached for the Niners yeah. and the Falcons. That's right, man. He sucks. Okay. Uh, and, you know, my personal record book. The Mavs beat the Heat in 2006 as well. Right, Damn right. Damn right. Damn right. Yeah. Yeah. You're bummed about that, though. Uh, RJ Ochoa here blogging the boys. Chances to win the Super Bowl through Sunday of Week 12, according to 538. That's an ESPN branch, and they specialize in the analytics and the projections and the simulations and all that. The number one chance to win the Super Bowl, Chiefs, mm-hmm. 23%. Number two, Cowboys at 15%. Hello. Eagles third. Bills fourth. Bills look vulnerable as well. Niners are down here at at 8%. I don't know what the hell 538 is smoking there. but Are we overrating the uh, the, uh, 49ers? No. No. Uh, 538 is underrating them. And uh, we're not not overrating. I'm petrified. 